through their local authorities for social housing, and this was off balance sheet. Now, I, maybe someone told me a tall story, but I want to check it out. It's interesting. If that can be done, because I know the Department of Environment have been looking at ways of trying to get local authority houses off balance sheet, but it seems that it looks as if, from what I've been told, it may not be simple now. You know, you often hear travellers' tales, and when you check the detail, uh, they'd be partially true, but not applicable to Ireland. But I think uh, if we look at NAMA and we look at PPPs, you should have a look at the European Investment Bank and see can the European Investment Bank be used uh, to fund PPPs where the local authority would be the central agent, and if that could go off balance sheet. Because if that were to happen, it would reveal, relieve a huge financial bottleneck and would really get, it, get, the, get the thing moving for social housing. Thank you, and, I think you had uh, the government bond. Yeah, I mean, there's no problem in having a government bond and calling it a government housing bond. And we'd get the money at less than 1% for 10 years. If we went out to 20 years, we'd still get it at something up 110 or 120, something like that. And I'm saying 20 years because that'd be the kind of life of a, a house paying for itself, you know, the, the model. But the trouble is to be all on balance sheet. And the key problem is not shortage of money. We, we can raise the money. You know, NTMA will raise money for us. It can go into the exchequer, and it can be used for house building. The problem is it goes on balance sheet, and then we break the fiscal rules. We break the expenditure ceilings. Now, there's a bit of relief down the line. where Our model would show us balancing the budget in 2018. And once we balance the budget, then, well, we have more scope. Uh, and again, to, you know, not to be too technical, up to now we're spending money on, if we can, reducing taxes a little, in, increasing expenditure across the key departments, and reducing the deficit. Once you, basset, once you balance the budget, the money is only going two ways. It's either reducing taxes or increasing expenditure. So then you get a lot more scope, and we have already committed to reviewing the capital programme in 2018. Uh, because we'll have balanced the budget, so we'll have extra resources. And in reviewing the capital programme, obviously extra money will go towards housing. So again, I want to give you a background for your own work. Minister, just one technical point in relation to the off-balance sheet, and I'll take the next question, Sam. The housing voluntary sector uh, state they borrow, they, they get a grant of 30% and borrow 70%. Is the 30% that they get from the state on balance sheet and the 70% they borrow themselves off balance sheet? I think it depends on the model they use. Could one of the official self? Yeah. Um, <coughs> the 70% I think you refer to is the funding from the Housing Finance Agency and the, the funding of the Housing Finance Agency is on the state balance sheet. It's guaranteed by the Minister so it is on the state balance sheet. So effectively, whether well, I suppose from point of clarity for the committee because it has right, the funding whether it's through the voluntary sector or through local authorities is reflected the same way from the from the point of view of the balance sheet. Understanding, yes. Unless they can come up with a PPP model, and the Department of the Environment have been looking at this for quite a while, and they haven't yet proposed a model to me that's off balance sheet. Thank you, Minister. I'll take a number of questions. Deputy O'Dowd, please. Um, I'd just like to thank the Minister for his uh, frankness and his views there, and it's very welcome to hear your open comments. I just have a few questions basically take on board what you're saying. A lot of first-time buyers find it possible to get into the market, and we know one of the reasons is they can't come up with the 10% with the, with the deposit. Uh, and at the same time, um, there's a lot of land which is infill sites and local, owned by local authorities or by you know, banks of land owned by state organisations. And I don't know, would you, would you have a view? Is there, is there a possibility of using your uh, strategic investment fund, you know, who have a lot of money, I think as far as I know they're off balance sheet, uh, that they could invest at a, com at a commercial level to fund the development, to, say the infrastructure of, of these sites, and, it would, it would, and that the qualifying people would be first time buyers uh, or proposals for social housing. Is there, is there a fast tracking that could be done there? If we own the land and we have money, why can't we service it? and specifically look after uh, that category of person 
the other two questions are, uh, would he look again at the room to rent scheme, which is where uh, people who have spare capacity in their homes, I think uh, they have to be, I think, one single individual, uh, uh, where they can get up to 12,000 in terms of a tax break income for the year. The person who takes the room to rent gets a tax break against the, the rent that they pay. So could you actually vary the qualifi qualifying conditions there so you'd have uh, more people offering accommodation, particularly, I suppose, with target, uh, you know, people who are empty nesters, people who have significant space available in their homes. Would you look at that? And uh, the, the other point is one which you've already touched on, uh, is the question of over shop development in, if you take a town like Drogheda, say 70, 80 years ago, there was, uh, you know, it was buzzing with people. There were hundreds of people living in our town centre. There's nobody living there now. Uh, and is there an incentive that you could use uh, that would allow people, I presume you'd have to give it to the owners or people, I presume it would have to be incentivised to developers or the owners to actually uh, put modern uh, accommodation in there that meets all the significant requirements you talk about in town centres uh, in terms of fire hazards and all of that. But is there, is there a fast track mechanism you could have that would encourage the development because the infrastructure is there, the water is there, the sewage is there, the, the shops are there. It seems to me a, a huge area that if, if you could incentivise it, it could have a very significant uh, and very quick um, outcome for people who are on a housing list. And Deputy O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, just a couple of questions. The first one is in relation to the vacant site levy. And I know there were legal reasons why it can't come in until 2019. It, <clears throat> why did you not look at charging more than the 3%? You know, we do know that there have certain people have been sitting on vacant sites for considerably long periods of time. Um, second question is in relation to NAMA and pressure being put on them to provide more units of social housing. And the other on that, and again, a concern to your role, that, you know, we do need more social housing. The 10% is not going to fulfil the need. So are we not looking at, in, at increasing that? Um, if land banks are identified as belonging to the state, and going back on that point, how quickly can they, can they be transferred and used for housing? Um, can I just ask, on the Living City Initiative, you're saying it's geared towards owner-occupiers, the, the, the work that they do. How long do they stay as owner-occupier? Because what we're seeing in Dublin is people with very big houses and they are converting them into very unsuitable accommodation, tiny box rooms is how I would describe it, because there is a demand for a certain type of housing. And the other point on the first time buyers, I mean, what we know is that people are paying more in rent than they would actually pay if they had a mortgage. Um, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Minister. To, uh, thanks very much. Uh, Deputy... Deputy O'Dowd, first of all, um, the, um, I think I referred to in my speech that the Irish Strategic Investment Fund, under the auspices of the NTMA, uh, is involved now in funding to increase the supply of housing. Uh, it's in partnership, for example, with the private equity firm KKR, and it has created a fund called Active Capital. It's a 500 million fund. Uh, the uh, ISAF is putting in 325. KKR is putting in 175 million. And uh, that will support the construction of 11,000 new homes. So ISAF are, are, are certainly uh, playing a, a strong part there. Uh, you asked about the room to rent. Uh, in the last budget, I think it was, uh, we increased the tax relief from 10k to 12k. Now, what I was trying to do actually was to move to a situation where a house owner, for example, someone on their own who has lost their partner, that they could get they could rent two rooms and get benefit. But again, I take advice from you of where we can pitch it. It's marginal now. I mean, obviously, we can't give a massive tax break. And uh, the kind of people who would be inclined to rent a room in their house, they're not very high-income people. And like a sense to reason that 
there's a limit, your income limits what you can gain from a tax break. Like if you haven't a taxable income, you're not going to benefit from a tax break. So there isn't much of a margin there. Uh, but I wouldn't be adverse to moving it up another bit if you thought uh, another thousand or two uh, would incentivize the rent of a second room in the, in the house, you know. Uh, we're in trouble then from uh, the latest, um, the people you, you, you connect to with in the app if you, want a, if you want a room in Paris for the weekend. Airbnb. 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 Airbnb are looking for a tax break as well, and they want the, the room to rent to apply to them. And you can see reasons why we won't be conceding on that. So it's, uh, the room to rent thing is for, for the homeowners. It, ha it has some potential, but not an awful lot of potential. Uh, on the land, uh, there is land <coughs> in public ownership, and there's land uh, <coughs> owned by various state agencies and so on. What I'm disposed to do is to put a fund in place of maybe 100 million or so uh, to uh, fund the opening up of land which is inaccessible now. So it would be kind of service roads and uh, primary utilities. So not all land is ready to build on, obviously, and get the local authorities to open up land. And again, you might develop that idea and give me advice on it, have a look at that, and, and see what's the potential on that. Um, Deputy O'Sullivan, the vacant science levy, that's a Department of Environment issue. And I understand, understand they had to defer it on legal advice. The constitutional position is very strong on property rights. And uh, they had to have a long lead in time to avoid a challenge. <coughs> and again, the 3% the levy was guided uh, by that. Because of the strong property rights, they had to. They had to impose a levy that was proportionate and would be regarded maybe are challengeable if they had imposed a, a very strong levy or a higher levy. So I'm not the, I wasn't the decision maker on that, but it's, uh, it, it's in that space the problem was and that's why it landed uh, there. Uh, it doesn't incentivize anybody at the moment, but I think it will as we get nearer to the implementation date. I would hope that uh, land which would be subject to, to it in the future will come back into the market and be used uh, for the building of houses. Uh, I think that's the, the, the yeah, that, that's, that's the intention anyway. The 10 percent, <coughs> I think that's the part five, is it, regulation of the Housing Act? Yeah, it's 10 percent for social housing and 10 percent for affordable housing. So the full piece is 20%. And uh, I think you know the arguments yourself from the constituencies. Uh, if, you, if you increase the percentage too much, then you won't get private purchasers to buy the other houses. So, you know, it's a question of balancing the two. And uh, it's more of a, a market problem and a social problem rather than a legislative problem. Uh, it has worked to a certain extent, but now that housing supply is short, uh, it, it's working less well, in my view. And uh, do they still have the arrangement in the local authorities where uh, builders can get money instead of an allocation of houses? Is, 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 is that still there? That's gone. Mm -hmm. it's gone yeah. So, um, uh, Yeah, uh, do you, how long do you, do you have to stay in the house to, in, in the Living Cities initiative? Well, the tax break is over 10 years. So the way it is, if you, if you purchase and you kind of do up the house and it costs you 100000 you can write it off against tax at 10000 a year for 10 years. So it's not that there's an obligation for you to stay, but you lose your benefit if you move. So, and the tendency, if it was working properly, would be to stay for the full life of the tax break, which is 10 years, you know.
Could I just ask on, on that one, is there a monitoring of it then, so that the, the grant is not being abused? Uh, just a point of clarification, I've got a note here. The Part 5 is 10% only. It was reduced from the original 20% in the Planning Act in order to reduce construction costs. So I said 20%, that's historic. Minister, just before I take, take the next, next question, just to comment on the, the vacant site levy, and you quite rightly say the <coughs> advice to government was, you know, that there was a long lead in and a lower rate to avoid a court challenge, and I suppose to date the advice has been sustained in the sense there hasn't been a court challenge, but I don't necessarily think a court challenge might have been a bad result in the sense it might have brought a greater degree of clarity in the sense that maybe the levy and the lead in time was very conservative to avoid the challenge rather than the outcome of the challenge. I'll just make, make that point. Deputy Quinlevin. Thank you. Um, firstly, welcome the Minister. He's obviously a constituency, constituency colleague of myself. Um, Minister, you started off by saying that success has been slower than we liked, and I think that's kind of, um, everyone will agree with that. You also said um, that the crisis in the housing that we have is not obviously the same in the crisis we have in Limerick as we have nationally, and obviously I would agree with you in that, but we do have a crisis in Limerick. Um, there's 5,000 people on the social housing list in Limerick, and you said as well that probably you divide, multiply that by five by the number of people who are looking for a house. So we're talking about, if you divide it by five, by five, obviously you're talking about a thousand social housing probably be needed to solve most of the problems there. The, the government social housing strategy 2020 has 3.8 billion euros over the next six years. I don't believe that's enough. The outgoing government, um, depending on that strategy, would be to deliver 80% of those 100,000 houses on, on, in the private sector. And I don't think anybody in the committee agrees that that's going to be successful. We often hear that we're restricted in spending by EU fiscal laws, and the Minister might clarify that by asking, answering the following questions I have on that issue. And just to preface the questions by saying that Ireland has the, lowest, has the youngest population in Europe, and that's expected to be the fastest growing over the next 30 years. Despite this, we have the second lowest uh, level of public capital expenditure in the EU. Given, Minister, that there is an ability to push for greater flexibility at European level on EU fiscal rules to support long-term investment programmes, has the Government asked for an additional leeway to allow us to invest sufficiently in housing? Two, if not, to date, why not? And three, if not, will you consider doing so? And I just want to preface all that by giving the scale of the housing crisis, which was highlighted to us yesterday at the launch of um, the Mercy Law Centre's policy, where there's been a 43% increase in homelessness from 2014 to 2015, 3,930 homeless adults, we have 1,881 children in emergency accommodation, and the urgent need for investment. Does the Minister think that it's wise to progress with cuts to the USC when we have this crisis facing us? My second area is around mortgages and the they, what I believe is, is, is a crisis at the moment in mortgaging, but what's going to be get worse. A recent um, committee of, of the um, housing, housing Committee, uh, Conor Skehan from the Housing Agency said, and I'd like to quote him direct, directly because I think what he said was, was crucial, and he said, to quote him, this is nettled and must be grasped by the incoming government. Their rears will peak, so to speak. The numbers are enormous and they will dwarf all other matters we are discussing, such as emergency accommodation and other things. It is uncomfortable that the bullet we have to, will have to be bitten, whatever cliches one wants to use. We urge the committee to get to the government to get the government to give its highest priority to addressing this issue. It will not go away. As we get closer to negative equity going away, we will see banks tempted to release, realise their assets. We must act urgently and the committee must use its voice to make sure that this urgent issue is known to government." Unquote Mr Skehan. And I think that obviously is something we're dealing with in our constituency offices every single day. We know that many buy to lets are in serious problems and that sales has forced many people from, from those properties. They wouldn't, be the owner, they wouldn't be the owners of it, they would be the renters of it. And what action is the government going to take on buy to lets and other mortgages in distress, in particular to regulate vulture funds? How does the Minister propose to amend the code of practice of mortgage arrears? And the third one is there is, um, will the Minister sit down with the Justice Department and come up with a cross-departmental report to address the Land Conveniency Act, which people refer to as the Eviction Act, and insolvency service, which clearly contributes to families losing their homes. And the third issue I want to raise with you is around the issue of NAMA. And when NAMA was established, its terms of reference had a, included a social clause, and obviously I don't believe that's been delivered either. 
Mr. and I want to quote somebody else as well, Mr. Cummins from the County and City Management um, quoted that NAMA delivered 2,000 social units for housing within the last year. I understand that only 1,400 were delivered. Now, the Minister this morning said 2,000 as well, but you might have been talking up to, up, to, to, up to yesterday or whatever. So that might be clarified. I believe that only 1,400 were delivered, and some of them are still not tenanted as we speak. And Minister, uh, Minister Kelly said that the outgoing government was not in favour of rent certainty and claimed the Department of Finance opposed that. And I would like to ask the Minister, would he consider legislation to, in, to create a compulsory code of conduct for banks and funds where, where they are selling buy to their properties that are rented? The code of conduct needs to give sitting, te sitting tenants an extended notice to quit period of up to 12 months and the first option on becoming tenants in the property if it's bought by a new landlord. And secondly, we also need a legislative change to the mortgage rent scheme to make it easy for local authorities and housing associations to keep people in family homes in family homes who are facing repossession by banks and property funds. And would the Minister consider that? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Deputy. I'll take one other. And just in, in, or there's questions there, I better reply to Well, in a, in a bid to be of, a, you, you may reply, but in a bid to be of assistance, and just to remind the Deputy, the detail around NAMA, what you have is welcome, but we will also have a session with NAMA here. So if the Minister doesn't have the full detail, NAMA will be appearing before this committee. Sorry, Minister. Sir. Could I just clarify, have you many more questioners? It's just I'm looking at going up to speak. So There's uh, three more before. What time are you Is it okay speak? if I go now and come back then? So sort of if we're still in say, yeah. <laughs> session. You have three more people. After. Correct. Yeah, okay. Minister. Uh, first of all, I'd like to welcome Deputy Quinlivan. It's nice to see a fellow Limerick man here in this committee. Uh, when uh, I referred to uh, the issue in Limerick being of less uh, magnitude than the issue in Dublin, I wasn't talking about the uh, uh, local authority list for social housing. I specifically talked about homelessness. And it was homelessness I referred to. And I think you'd agree that while there is a homeless problem, in Limerick is not of the same magnitude as in Dublin and as a consequence could be remediated easier. Extra capital for local authorities, yes, uh, but the allocation of capital they have, uh, they haven't spent it uh, for uh, 216. They're not on target for spending it and uh, there are other problems uh, in the relationship with between the Department of the Environment and the local authorities and also in the capacity of the local authorities to use the funds they're given. Uh, but there will be a review of the capital programme uh, in 2018, maybe 2017, the way, the way things are going. And uh, at present it looks as if there will be extra capital to be allocated over the five-year period of the capital programme. And of course social housing will be uh, very important. On the flexibility clause in the European rules, uh, it's there. Uh, we have talked about it in Europe, but we push very hard. But at present, we do not meet the criteria for applying, given the economic cycle and other factors. Uh, however, investment uh, can be smoothed over over four years, as I said previously. Uh, and uh, the fiscal rule that applies to uh, capital is taken over a four-year cycle. So. You know, a million can be four million uh, when you when you put it across the four-year cycle. Uh, I'll ask uh, Chief Economist John McCarthy <coughs> to comment on the flexibility issue when I deal with your other questions. Yeah, the government is is committed, as we always were, to uh, reducing and eventually phasing out USC. It was introduced as an emergency tax, and in our agreement with uh, Fianna Fáil and their support for a minority government. Uh, we have agreed that uh, the emphasis will be on uh, reductions in USC for low and middle income people uh, in particular, but not exclusively. And that's our position on that. Like, it comes back to a very simple point. I mean, we all learned when we were kids the story of killing the ghost that lays the golden egg. And if you kill the economic goose that's laying the resources for all the social and economic objectives we have, you'll have no golden egg and you'll be able to do nothing. And the USC is for the people at work. They're paying too much personal taxes. And we have to progressively uh, encourage working people and give them extra uh, spending through the tax system as well as through wage increases. And then 
we may continue to grow as you know we're projecting five percent for this year and uh, you know ne nearly four for next year but there's a balance i mean you can't just spend on social programs and say to the taxpayer you're going to pay for this now lads keep working we admire the way you work we'd like to compliment you on your hard work we have to keep a balance in the economy where working people uh, can see the value of their work as well in the pay package. And uh, that's why we're, we're committed to uh, USC. But we, have, we will agree that now that we're out of the main crisis that nearly bankrupt the country, that social programs have to be repaired. And uh, of the money available to us, we'll spend a much bigger proportion on expenditure than in tax cuts, but we will still uh, put some tax cu cuts into any budget uh, so that working people can benefit from their hard work as well as from the improvement in uh, social services. So uh, I, I think it's wise. Uh, mortgage arrears is, is a big problem. The measures that have been put in place have worked. Uh, the people in arrears, uh, there's a very big decline in the number of people in arrears now. Uh, it's gone well below 50% uh, of what were affected when the crisis commenced uh, for two reasons, uh, for the measures that were introduced and the banks implementing them, but also as people go back to work. Uh, they're in a position to service their mortgages again. And uh, a lot of people now are picking up again where they left off in their payments or reduced payments simply because they're back to work or because their partner is back to work. Uh, so it is self-correcting. But we're in a situation now where just north of uh, 30,000 people uh, with mortgages are in particular difficulty. It's like a, a hard core of people who are finding it very difficult to cope. And uh, in the programme for government, we're designing a new set of initiatives uh, to deal with that particular cohort. And you'll see it in the next 24, 48 hours. I don't want to bridge confidence but but it's not just uh, it's not just you know a couple of make weight measures added to what's there already uh, this is a major departure to deal specifically with uh, that cohort of people uh, that are not being reached by uh, the existing measures and uh, NAMA on their social uh, mandate in in the NAMA act well they are fulfilling it uh, first of all they're providing uh, houses and uh, the figures I gave you are the figures we got from NAMA. Uh, they have provided well in excess of 4,000 houses, but the local authorities don't take them all up for a variety of reasons. Uh, I'm not sure what the reasons always are, but it's to do with local authority policy. It's not a failing on the NAMA side. But NAMA say they have given and taken, that 2,000 houses have been given and taken up. Another part of their fulfilling their social mandate is using their cash flow and their available resources to build 20,000 affordable houses over the next five years. That's a huge uh, commitment uh, to social policy because we all agree that there's a supply side problem with housing and they can do it off balance sheet. Uh, as well as that, all over the country you'll have examples of NAMA uh, selling at cost. Uh, playing pitches to, 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 to sports clubs, uh, accommodation of various kinds, and I'm sure different deputies would be able to give examples uh, for the, from their own constituencies. Uh, so they're very strong, a very strong social mandate. Uh, the other thing that the deputies who are here for a while know is that NAMA have an email helpline and a telephone helpline for deputies. And while you cannot legally make representations to NAMA on a commercial issue. You're quite legally entitled as a deputy uh, to seek any information that you require from NAMA uh, about their social programs or about their policies or about their sales programs. And you can do it by accessing through telephone or email. And you, you, you know, you're, you're not committing any kind of an offense. You're not putting yourself at any ethical risk as long as you stop short of lobbying for a commercial uh, reason uh, when you're into 
it's, it, when you're when you're doing business with them. And uh, I, th I, th uh, I think you had one last point. I'm gone to the stage where I can't read my own writing. Rent certainty. Yeah, rent certainty, oh, yeah, rent yeah, certainty. Rent certainty was the last one. Um, we think that it could be counterproductive. I remember the 90s and there was a housing crisis. <coughs> And uh, it led eventually to the burst, which we had. And there were three Bacon reports. Uh, Dr. Bacon brought out three reports to, to intervene in the market. Intervening in the market can be quite tricky. And uh, a lot of the interventions that were done that time, that caused more trouble than provided solutions. And you want to be very careful. I mean, it is very easy to have rent certain. Uh, so we'll control rents and we won't allow rents to, to rise. And then who's going to get involved in investing in rental property? I mean, unless a landlord in the private sector can generate an income from investing in a block of apartments or in a house that he converts into two apartments, he's not going to do it. And if you bring about a situation where you interfere with the market so that normal commercial activity doesn't proceed, you're not fixing it. You're causing the problem. And when we got proposals from environment about rent certainty, my advice was that some of the proposals could cause difficulty. So there was a difference of opinion. And certain things we agreed with and certain things we didn't. But, I mean, you have to be very careful because most of the housing market is supplied by the private sector. Affordable houses are supplied by the private builders. Rental accommodation is provided by the private landlords. And you can intervene to increase supply. But if you try and intervene to restrict, if you, if you, if you intervene in a way, the consequences of which are to restrict supply, you can improve the situation for a cohort of tenants on a temporary basis, but you lock everybody else out of the market. So it's, 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 it's very tricky. And I'm not claiming now at all to have a, a monopoly of the knowledge. Maybe there are measures around rent certainty that would work, uh, but not the ones that were proposed to me uh, from the Department of the Environment. So that's the reason that, that we, didn't go down, we didn't go down that road. Uh, but I'll, I'll finish with you where I started. There is a supply side problem, and it needs to be, to be fixed very quickly. There's a funding problem as part of that. There's a financial problem. And uh, I'm absolutely delighted that the first serious action of this parliament is your committee that would address these issues and bring forward uh, a report after due analysis that can be turned into policy to help to resolve the situation. Yes. Uh, on the flexibility. Oh, yes, sorry. I can be very brief, Deputy. <coughs> um, at, the, at the beginning of last year, the Commission introduced what's known as the Investment Clause into the Stability and Growth Pact. Uh, it was designed to promote investment, okay? Uh, I suppose the problem with it is that the eligibility criteria for a member state to qualify for the clause uh, were set at very strict levels. And this was done unilaterally by the Commission, I, I would stress, uh, without really any input from member states. So the eligibility criteria are they're quite technical, but, but two of them would be <coughs> a member state needs to have a negative output gap, so it needs to have a very poor performing economy. We have a positive output gap at the moment, so that restricts uh, uh, our ability to apply for this clause. The other is that you're, you, uh, all member states are supposed to be close to a balanced budget in, in structural terms. We're, we're too far away from that position at the moment to be able to apply. However, as the Minister said, said the, the so-called expenditure benchmark does smooth investment over four years, so for each each uh, X that you put in, you can kind of get four times X in, in year one. So that does give you a little bit of flexibility on that front. Okay, thank you. I have a number of other people presenting. Deputy Byrne. Thanks, and thank you, Chair. And thank you very much, Minister, and uh, for the rest of the department as well. Thank you very much for this morning. Um, I have only two questions, but a number of, um, I suppose, observations. One of the questions is about NAMI. And, basically around 6,600 units and why only 2,000 of them, I think somebody else raised it before, have been delivered into social housing and what's happening to the 4,600. You may not be able to answer but 
as chair said we might get an answer from NAMA. We do have NAMA, yeah. Le okay. Uh, just two things I want to raise. Minister, as you know very well, I was reared in, in, in all my life in the inner city and surrounded by Dublin City cows and housing developments, flat complexes, Ballyferma, Inchcar, Crumlin and Drimley. And it, it always astonished me now why City Council could never have been able to continue the building system that they did a local authority and I think if we're serious about about supplying social housing or other forms of housing we need to look back again at local authorities and I suppose maybe to restart the whole investment in local authorities being able to build and born and reared in, 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 in Dublin City Council House it was normal practice that uh, most of the maintenance of the house was done by council in the past and now none of that happens because of the reduction in staff which leading to an awful lot of properties completely going into really bad states and therefore they end up back into the council and a lot of them take a long time to bring back into any kind of shape to be rehoused again or put back out to the market. So I suppose if there's any way at all this committee can encourage some kind of policy around local authorities taking up the mantle again and building, I think that's that's one of the things I would like to see. I'm glad you raised the question about homelessness and housing because I raised this uh, last week with uh, Dick Brady, the city manager around the homeless figures of the 5,801 people who are homeless. And I broke it down, as they did, about the number of adults and children. And the question I asked them, can you give me a figure of how many, a figure of, how many of them are actually family units? And he came back with 790. And yesterday, I, I received this report. I wasn't actually at the launch, but I read it last night from the Mercy Law Resort Centre which is in my, in my constituency, around since 2004-2015, there's been a 43% increase in homelessness. And when you break down the amount of adults and children, they come out with 912 homeless families. And just like what you said, it was very true. If we were to house those who are homeless now, as we would need, according to this report, is 912 houses, and then we would be laughing at that end. But the other question I asked them was, on the figures of the home, of housing, the housing authorities across the city, could it be broken down into how many are actually being rehoused, how many people are waiting on a transfer list, how many people are on the long term list? Because I believe part of the problem around the homeless situation is what we've done ourselves as a government in the last two years, particularly within 2014 and 2015, declaring homelessness as a priority. And I could sit here and give you some really serious cases I've dealt with where people have actually handed back keys of housing to go on the homeless list and live in a hostel or a hotel because they believe now if they're on the homeless list they're made a priority. Um, in my short career in politics and in my <coughs> other career as being working voluntary in the community, I've, I dealt on a daily basis with families and children. And I believe that in many ways the figures that the council have aren't really the true figures of a man, a many units is used is needed in, in, in the coming years. Um, if we were to go on some of the reports and build thousands of houses, I can guarantee you we'd have lots lying idle as well in Dublin that wouldn't be needed. So I need what we need is exact figures from the local authorities of exactly many family housing units are needed. And if you read this report, it's very clear in this report that we've, if we were to deal with the homeless crisis tomorrow in the city and built 912 houses, we would be able to deal with that. And I really believe we need to nail um, down the local authorities on the housing supply and the many family units are actually needed. Uh, there, I, I don't have any other questions, only to say that I am dealing with people now who are 12 years on a transfer list, 12 and 13 years on a transfer list. They are accommodated by City Council, but they're in units that are totally inadequate for the size of their families because their families have grown up. And just for I have one family has four grown-up children living in a two-bedroom masonette that should have been housed ten years ago. But because of the homeless crisis and because of the increase in the demand now under the homeless as being a priority, a lot of these people now are going to continue to be on that list and never rise back up to the top again. Deputy Thank you. Thank, I know I, don't, I didn't finish. I, I know I don't have a lot of questions, any, but I do believe that the, the way to go is what you have said. We need to go back to the local authorities and give them command again of being able to facilitate and supply social housing. And just on a footnote, I can only say this about my own constituency. 
the amount of houses that have been bought for the detenant in the Teresa's Gardens, Fanima Mansions, uh, Dolphin House has been huge and the council has done a, a huge job on the ground locally trying to buy houses through the money from the Department of Environment and also in filling many of the voids that were left on. So in that sense I believe they're doing their job but we need to go back to them and get exact figures of how many homeless housing families we need. Th thank you Deputy. Before I go to you Minister, just to comment that some of those questions probably are more relevant to the Department of the Environment rather than the Minister for Finance and we will have, it's our expectation. Uh, I was agreeing with his... I'm, no, I'm not disagreeing with you, but I'm trying to, to say, in trying to elicit the information you're looking for, it might be more appropriate from the Department of the Environment than the Minister for Finance. And I'd just say to the other remaining people with questions, it's the Minister for Finance specific questions, if you have any. Uh, Deputy Ryan, and we'll come to you then, Minister. Uh, thanks, Chair. Uh, Minister, um, over the last couple of years, we've had organisations, and, and I've, um, I've met one or two of them in my time, uh, who are hovering around. Uh, these are organisations who have money, who have capital, uh, who have expertise in delivering homes, and we're interested in delivering a uh, quite substantial number of homes to the state, uh, but obviously in return uh, for a return to themselves over maybe a mortgage-type period. Uh, but the model would also have included the, the homes themselves coming into state ownership after about 20, 25 years at the end of a fixed period. Now, uh, have you, uh, have, have, has that model uh, come to you in, in the last number of years? Uh, and if so, look, to me it looked like an attractive enough model, but was the problem uh, about uh, payments to these organisations being on balance sheet? Or was there any, was there, was there, would there be any scope for having such a model which wouldn't necessarily, which might comply with fiscal rules. That's my one and only question. Minister, do you want to refer to those? And I have two final questioners. Yes, there. please. Uh, thanks very much, Chairman. Uh, first of all, Deputy Catherine Burns, uh, questions on NAMA. Uh, the NAMA identified by the end of March 2016, which is very recent, 6,637 houses that they could transfer to local authorities. The local authorities uh, commented or, or, or confirmed that they had demand for 2,540 of these houses, and 2,042 were delivered by the end of March. So there's about 500 uh, that aren't delivered yet, but they are agreed by both sides as uh, suitable and wanted by the local authorities. Uh, why, why didn't they take up the whole 6,000 of them? I suppose the short answer, I'm not absolutely sure. But some of the reasons are, uh, you know the way a local authority has uh, a housing policy about proportions of local authority houses and uh, private houses in the one estate? If NAMA have a whole estate, you know, with 60 or 70 houses in it, uh, the local authority won't take the full amount. They'll take a proportion of them. So what they describe as concentration issues, where there are too many social housing units too close together. There are some areas then where uh, there isn't really a demand. The houses are in an area where there isn't a, a demand for the houses. Uh, but NAMA continues to, to do their best and work with the local authorities. And I was talking to the chairman of NAMA actually yesterday, and he committed to uh, doing another search and providing extra houses to the local authorities uh, within the, the next couple of months. Um, I welcome Deputy Byrne's explanation uh, statistically of uh, the supply situation in Dublin in respect of homelessness and how less than a thousand units would fulfil the demand and uh, solve the homelessness problem on the basis of the information provided by the local authorities in Dublin. And it comes back to the point I made. There's a tipping point issue which needs to be addressed and addressed uh, very quickly. Uh, the uh, housing, voluntary housing uh, organisations, Deputy Ryan, are active in providing houses. Private sector organisations come up with schemes at times, but they go to the Department of the Environment rather than to me. So I, I don't have a lot of information on them. But I think John McCarthy, our economist, may have some information of a cross-department nature, John. 
Um, well, I suppose from, from our side, uh, I think you, you were requesting whether it could be uh, accommodated within within the fiscal rules. I mean, it all comes back to whether or not such funding uh, is is on or off balance sheet. I mean, if it is is included on balance sheet, then the expenditure will need to be met by uh, reductions elsewhere or by higher taxation and so forth, and, and uh, the fiscal rules are, are absolutely clear on this. Uh, if it's off balance sheet, of course, then um, then, then it can proceed. <coughs> but there are, uh, I would stress, I mean, we saw it, uh, was it about two weeks ago with the, the AIB transfer and so forth, Eurostat are becoming increasingly sort of intrusive in terms of the on-off balance sheet type of classifications and so forth, and we've, we've obviously had some issues there in the past, not just in Ireland, but, but in every country. So, um, you know, the, the, it's... It's, it's a difficulty, and uh, that they are they are becoming very intrusive, as I say. So, so moving uh, expenditure off balance sheet is, is becoming increasingly an issue for for some member states, for all member states, I would say. Thank you. I have two final uh, people presenting: Deputy Wallace and then Deputy Coppinger. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Minister, um, I think. Uh, most people would agree that um, all is not well in how we uh, go about supplying housing in Ireland, and uh, it didn't start with this government. It's been like it for a long time, and I'm very much aware that a lot of it doesn't actually come under your remit, um, whether there's any merit for uh, a separate housing um, department, uh, given that there are so many different strands to it. There probably is, given that there are so many issues that... Uh, that you're involved in, that, uh, that's, uh, and then there's a whole lot of so many others that, that you're not involved in. I mean, you say, Minister, you started off in your piece about that this is very much a supply side problem. And yeah, there is a supply problem, but there wasn't a supply problem uh, 10 years ago, and uh, we still had a problem. Uh, we had plenty of units, but they weren't affordable. And uh, surely affordability is at the heart of the problem around uh, the supply of housing in Ireland, whether you're trying to rent a unit, whether you're trying to buy one, or whether you're just trying to get one uh, from the state because you can't afford either of the first two. And uh, it's reached a stage where I'd say the amount of money uh, from your take-home pay if you have a job uh, that is required to go towards your keeping a roof over your head is greater in Ireland than in most countries. And uh, it's, I think it's a, it's a big problem that um, hasn't really been addressed, and there's many uh, dimensions to that. Um, Minister, back in, on the 15th of January 2014, myself and you had a discussion in the chamber about REITs. And at that time, you, uh, I was uh, warning about the possibility that... Uh, this could distort the rental market in Dublin, and, and you replied to me that only two REITs have been established so far, and both are capitalised at around 400 million. Two REITs with a total investment of 400 million is not going to distort any market or give anybody control. The REIT system will raise standards, and if something goes wrong, I will move to correct it. But so far, it's moving in the right direction as intended. Now, I think you told us today that that figure has uh, moved to about 2.2 billion and rising and will rise. Uh, Minister, uh, do you think it's a problem that uh, it does appear, uh, given that people in Ireland didn't have access to finance, and now you were eager to bring in foreign money so that these people uh, would buy them, um, but they've bought these units at fire sale prices uh, with powerful tax uh, incentives uh, in how it, this, this, the, the vehicle was, was structured, and they now control uh, a very important uh, chunk of, of the rental market. And it has led to uh, a, an example I've given a few times is that uh, apartments that I happen to have built uh, in Dominic Street that were 900 a month uh, three and a half years ago are now 1,500 a month. It has become very, very difficult uh, to rent an apartment in, in Dublin city centre, and Dominic Street isn't Balls Bridge by any means. Uh, some people would still be afraid to walk up there at night time. 
Uh, I'm just wondering, Minister, uh, if you think that there's going to be there's going to be a, a, a time where breaks should be put on this. Uh, how far does it go? Uh, I know I've heard you speak about the idea of a professional landlord, and you're very fond of it, but that's all very well. Uh, but what, what, if, what if people can't afford uh, to rent off a professional landlord? Uh, it creates a bigger problem. Uh, on the NAMA uh, issue, uh, just around the 20,000 uh, units, um, you're saying that because of uh, the fear of state aid, and you mentioned the, the developers that have actually uh, appealed to Europe uh, about it. Um, I think uh, the majority of people now in Ireland who have a problem uh, about renting a house or getting one or buying one, uh, the vast majority of them couldn't possibly afford to pay 300,000 for a unit. Um, and you're saying that NAMA have, uh, are obliged uh, to make a, a commercial uh, profit uh, from their activities. Um, well, if this, given that the state owns this land, um, do you not think that, uh, is, is it not possible to create some sort of an arrangement whereby the state can actually, uh, if, if it can't be NAMA, 20,000 units is a lot, but surely a minimum of a third of those have to be made available to those who can't afford to pay 300,000. Now, no matter what, if the land is already uh, belonging to the state, it does not cost more than 150,000 euro to build a 1,000 square foot house, and the average house in Dublin is less than 1,000 square feet. Uh, I'm just asking you, Minister, if there is some way that the state can engage uh, in supplying at least a third of them, at least uh, toward those who can't possibly afford to be paying 300,000. Um, on the, uh, the vacant site levy was raised, and I know that's also under, under the remit of the Department of Environment, uh, but there is a tax issue. Um, around sites, around land banking, that hasn't never been dealt with by the state, and uh, you're probably more familiar with the Kenny report than I ever was, given it was 1974, um, and I'm even younger than you. Um, there's, it's a huge, without a shadow of a doubt, uh, the biggest single problem around affordability of housing in Ireland is linked to land banking, and that's not changing. And now we have had, we have the investment funds, we have the likes of Heinz and, and Kennedy Wilson coming in. They haven't just bought units, they bought development land. And we're, we're almost uh, 10, 15 years ago, there was about 90% uh, of the banked land in the Dublin area, the greater Dublin area, was controlled by 26 people. Uh, now we have a foreign investor coming in and taking more, more or less the same control over that area. And I think, I don't think it's rocket science to see that that's, this is going to be problematic down the road. And I'm wondering, is, there, is this going to be dealt with? And I know the issue of uh, the powerful rights to property uh, as a uh, overriding those of the individual in a constitution is problematic. Uh, for the life of me, uh, I don't understand why no government has actually dealt with it, uh, because I think, uh, do you not think, Minister, that we should actually address that issue uh, in the constitution so that we do have a greater flexibility uh, in this area and uh, be able to actually uh, stop the cancer that is land banking uh, in Ireland. Uh, just, just Deputy, in a, in a bit to be helpful, as a committee that issue you're talking about in relation to the constitution we will deal with specifically when we have a session on legal issues and you're, you're quite entitled to ask the minister but just for your own advice we will, we will try and look at that a bit further. Yeah, um, Minister, uh, when you were talking about uh, void houses and, well, and I, I, again it's very much uh, part of the, the Minister of the Department of Environment uh, but you talk about uh, the fact that it's taken, it takes the private sector four to six weeks to turn around the wide house, and you're right. And you're saying the local authority is taking two years. 
Uh, but do you think, Minister, and I know uh, your, your department is finance, not local government uh, or environment, but if, if, if that is the, a problem with local authorities, do you not think we should strengthen them rather than just uh, undermine them? Uh, if the local authorities are not delivering in a way that they should be, uh, maybe they need far more support from central government because over the last 30, 40 years, there's no doubt about it, but uh, we, don't, uh, we don't really have good local authorities in Ireland anymore in comparison to our counterparts in Europe. And I think this is a big problem. I mean, I'm just wondering uh, for your ideas on it. And uh, given that our local authorities are totally dependent on central government for funding and uh, they are really not really, uh, it's not local government, it's, local, it's weak under finance uh, local administration. And I'm wondering, Minister, do you, what do you think of the idea of actually strengthening the local authorities? Just my last point, Minister, and uh, there's, was, you, you mentioned a number of times about um, the risks about interfering with the market. And um, when you were being asked about rent certainty in rental markets, but the truth be told is that in Europe there is stronger regulation in this area and it does work. And it, it works for the private sector as well as the client. And I'm wondering, Minister, do you not think that we should be learning uh, from the Europeans in this area? And sorry, uh, one last point, and uh, I know it's been raised in, sort of in different spheres today already, but um, if, Minister, I know you're, you were making the point that uh, our adherence to the fiscal rules is now enshrined in our constitution and we, can't, we couldn't possibly break our own law, but have, what do you think, Minister, of the idea of actually appealing to Europe to allow us a bit of breathing space? You talk about borrowing money lately at 0.81% on the markets, which is fantastic, and anyone in business uh, would absolutely love to be able to do that. Uh, it's, it, it's actually unheard of in the private sector. Uh, but the idea that the state would get a bit of breathing space from Europe to tackle what is definitely um, an emergency, a huge crisis around the supply of housing in Ireland in different forms, and the possibility if we were appeal to appeal to them to be allowed to borrow in the region of about 10 billion at, at 0.81% over a 10 or 20 year period, and that, it would not, that we would not be uh, caught under our 3% rule in doing so. Uh, we wouldn't be the first uh, to get a bit of breathing space in Europe, as you know, uh, but surely uh, we have been uh, very, very good buys, and uh, if Europe is the, really cares about uh, the individual countries, especially the smaller ones like ourselves, we have an emergency and uh, do you not think, Minister, uh, that it would be an idea to actually appeal for a bit of a break in that area? Thank you, Deputy. Minister, do you want to take the two questions or do you no, want to I'll answer that? Deputy Wallace first. Okay. Thank you very much, Michael. Always good to hear from you on your views on housing because I know you have expertise in the area of construction. Um, affordability is the first issue you raised, and you said affordability uh, was the issue rather than supply. But affordability is a function of supply. Like if you have more of any good or service, the price tends to go down. If you have less of it, the price tends to go up. So if you had more supply, the, the price would, would either you know, stabilize or tend to reduce, and then houses become more affordable. So, in my view, it's just another a word to describe the same problem, approaching it from a different point of view. And uh, again, it comes back to the issue of uh, what builder will build if the building costs are, uh, are the price of the house to construct it uh, is more than the equivalent house on the market. And, you know, there was a basic imbalance after our crisis, after the crash, and uh, there were parts of this city where you'd get a house for, you know, not so far from your own place, John, 150,000 there two years ago, and you wouldn't build for that. Like, 
you couldn't build for debt. So everyone, the model was broken anyway, and builders were impaired by debt. But it wasn't a, a financial proposition to build three bedroom semis when they were available as recently as two years ago on the market for significantly less than the price of construction. And, uh, but I mean, there is an affordability issue. 